recognizes for the invitation to speak. It's been a very uh, uh, right at the end. <laughs> um, uh, this is the mind ritual. Uh, thanks, yeah, for the invitation to speak. It's been a very enjoyable and enriching week uh, so far. <laughs> so um, I want us to talk. about how concepts from conformal geometry, well, basic concepts, particularly semi-conformal mappings and conjugate functions, which I'll define in a second, uh, can be defined in a very natural way on graphs. And here I mean um, purely in terms of the combinatorial structure of the graph. So I don't allow metric graphs, or uh, that's, I see that as cheating, or I don't allow a a network that would approximate, be a discrete approximation of a continuous space. The challenge is to define everything in terms of just knowing which vertices are connected to which other vertices. And as such, I claim that some graphs implicitly have uh, conformal structure. They're lurking unseen somehow, uh, which enables you to just talk about these things. And But first, let me just give you the basic definitions of the concepts from the smooth case that I'll need. Uh, so the first is that of a semi-conformal mapping. So a mapping phi uh, between two Riemannian manifolds uh, is semi-conformal. If uh, so, every point x where the derivative is not equal to zero, then its restriction uh, to the orthogonal complement of the kernel of the derivative, so call that the horizontal space uh, hx. So that will take hx to the tangent space on n. That is conformal and subjective. Well, as it's a linear map, that means really it's a homothetic. So that is. Uh, so uh, there exists a number under x positive, uh, such that to be really explicit, uh, lambda x squared uh, g x y uh, is h d phi x uh, d phi y. Therefore, x y uh, in the horizontal space of x. And then if I allow, so if I set the lambda x zero when d phi x uh, is zero, then I get a continuous function uh, lambda uh, from the manifold uh, to r, which is positive for can be zero at critical points, then a continuous function. This is called the dilation. Uh, so that's the basic notion of a semi-conformal mapping. It's conformal on the complement of the kernel, or the complement of the fibers, if you like. Do you, do you really want phi, d5 phi to be ma uh, maximal rank where this condition, or are you thinking of m as being one bigger than n? Uh, no, so here, yeah, so I want m to be bigger than n. So I do want it, so generally in the definition, the rank is n. One doesn't allow injective mappings. No, 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 but I, I mean, do you want uh, d5 to be, when, 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 I mean, do you want this... Uh, so I do want that to be subjective, yeah. So this means then that, um, is that an item? Yeah, no, no, that's all right. That's all right, yeah. Uh, but do, do you want, I mean, yeah. Is, H is hx supposed to be the same dimension as, as the tangent, as, as n? Yes. So, so that should be for d5 a maximal rank, perhaps. Not just not zero. Just not zero. 
Yeah, that's all I need in the definition, yeah. Oh, okay. So if d phi is non, that's, that's usually the hypothesis. I mean, you could modify a hypothesis, but, but then modify the definition, but that is the usual definition of semi-conform. When the derivative is non-zero, okay. then you require it to be maximal rank of n. So of rank n. Right. And no, yeah, I see what you're saying. You, you're asking, you'd like it to be either m or n. Is that right? But, but um, and no, I insist that it's n, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's like a Riemannian submersion. Well, yes. The well, Riemannian submersion would be the derivative would have to be maximal rank. So d five could could either be maximal rank or it could be zero or a little bit in between. Yeah, but the hypothesis is that it's if it's non-zero at all, it must be maximal rank. Okay, right. So that's implied. By that the is implied point. by the definition. Point, 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 point. Yeah. Okay. So if there is a if, if there's a point where the rank degenerates, yeah. yes. then it degenerates absolutely okay. to zero. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. I'll shut up now. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. So there's this function called the dilation, right? Um, and just uh, I want to. Uh, Right, so, so if, for example, phi, a special case, uh, phi takes some domain in R3 um, to C, I can write this another way. I can say then uh, phi, well, uh, I should say this uh, phi to R2, say, and if I write phi, if I name phi phi with a complex family mapping in C, <coughs> Sure. No, sorry, let me just uh, write it into C. So if that is semi-conformal into R2, as a map into R2, uh, well, it is semi-conformal as a map into R2 if and only if. Uh, so you'd have this equation I equals 1 to 3 by the x i squared is zero. So the gradient of the complex, the complex gradient, if you like, is an isotropic vector. So that's equivalent to semi-conformal. And if I then write phi then in the form f plus i g, then this is equivalent to uh, the condition that the length of the gradient of f is the length of the gradient of g. And these are mutually orthogonal. <coughs> okay, so that's a special case. Well, I could go for I've gone from R three. Okay, I could have gone from R n. So uh, let's take three for simplicity. Uh, and this brings us on to uh, brings me on to the definition of a conjugate function. Uh, conjugate functions. <coughs> well, this is the definition. So this is if and only if. So this is a definition. F and G F are conjugate. <coughs> to take that as a definition of conjugate functions in uh, in a domain of here R three, but I could extend that to any Riemannian manifold. Uh, I could talk about conjugate functions in this sense. So this this aspect. So here. Uh, uh, so with Mike, uh, so uh, <coughs> uh, Mike used to uh, We've been looking very closely at this problem of when a function admits a conjugate. So you can ask, given f, <coughs> uh, again, let me take our three. Oh, well, let me take our m. Uh, when does f <coughs> admit a conjugate? <coughs> so can you tell me, I mean, the only thing that is that the square product of number f number g is equal to zero, right? Yes. Ah, yeah. And now, since you're here, what stays from the left side of the equivalent side? From this left side, yes. Ah, yeah, so if and only if. 
if and only if that, if and only if that. If I write yeah, f, what is it, what is it? yeah, so if I write phi, so if I write phi, so if I write, so that is equivalent to that, writing phi equal to f plus ig. So if I write phi equal to f plus ig, this statement is equivalent to that statement. Is that okay? So given any function, say from a domain of our M or any Riemannian manifold, one can ask the question, does it admit a conjugate? And you know what the answer is if M equals 2, because then the pair F and G will define a conformal mapping between two-dimensional domains, which is then uh, holomorphic, or then F will be the real part of a holomorphic function, it will be harmonic, and conversely, any harmonic function is the real part of a uh, holomorphic mapping. So if m equals 2, the answer is if and only if, if and only if f is harmonic. That is, it satisfies a very neat equation like that. And if, so, so uh, like we've been studying this case, and the answer is very, is not, it's not trivial, <laughs> put it mildly. Um, the answer is that F must satisfy, uh, so we have a complete answer if M equals three, but not in other cases, uh, F must satisfy a second order differential differential inequality uh, that's the first point and the second point it must satisfy F must satisfy uh, two uh, third uh, order equations which I certainly won't attempt to write down um, so it's sort of I think it began with about 70 odd conformal invariance and maple. And finally, things are getting a little uh, neater than that, but uh, it's, uh, they're quite uh, tricky. Uh, everything, of course, is conformal invariant, so any equations you get with this kind of thing are going to be conformal invariant equations. Uh, so that, they're the two basic things, uh, which, uh, uh, and of course, conjugate functions is a special case, as I've indicated here, of semi-conformal mapping. Conformal invariant under which conformal group on the target or, or on domain? Well, in fact, there's a notion of semi-conformal at this point is um, in, in, invariant with respect to conformal transformation of the domain and of the co-domain. Yeah, it's completely mm -hmm. conformal invariant. Uh, <clears throat> I mean. But the case of conjugate functions, you're sort of looking for function and so another function, so you're you're mapping into R2, whereas you could then be looking for, in a more general situation, for semi-conformal mappings onto a, say, compact Riemann surface or something. So, and this, of course, this, this question here is being studied at a local level. So if you were looking at a semi-conformal mapping onto, say, a compact Riemann surface, you could take a conformal chart and map it into the plane, and then you would locally then have two conjugate functions. Yeah. <coughs> So uh, I probably spend far too long on this bit. So I'll very be brief on uh, the motivation. <laughs> uh, so how? Uh, why did I come across the graph aspect? Why do I? Why would I want to generalize these things to graphs? Uh, and this is really function twister theory. Um, <clears throat> so if I just remind you very briefly. Uh, one has the twister double vibration. Uh, so you have pairs of lines and planes. So a line contained in plane contained in C4. <coughs> this is of dimension 1. And this is two-dimensional subspace. And uh, one maps then to C3 uh, on one side and to the Grassmannian of two planes in C4 on 
the other side. And uh, you, would, you can think of this as a sort of complexification of compactified Minkowski space. So you can think of uh, Minkowski space as sitting in here. Okay. And uh, over here, uh, you have uh, the Hopf foundation to S4. And you can, it has an S3 in here. And uh, so if that's the standard Hopf foundation, uh, this contained in here is a CR hypersurface, uh, which is, you can see, as pi inverse of S3 if you get your conventions right. And uh, how do you go from one space to the other? Well, uh, you have, so if you pick a point, um, say, uh, so I'm using the standard Quist uh, Penrose notation here. Uh, so here, the indices A and A prime range over uh, 0 and 1. Uh, so this is a four components to this complex vector and so it's point in CP3 and you have this relation that psi A that modulo getting your convention right is psi x A A prime eta A prime where you sum over the uh, repeated indices and so on. And here they're one of these so there this is like uh, coordinates um, one not one prime one more prime x one one prime. Uh, these are like coordinates for the Grassmannian, local coordinates for this complex Grassmannian here. And uh, the basic object here, the basic object you're interested in, is a complex analytic surface. Uh, S contained in CP3. And uh, in general, uh, that will define, uh, right, uh, sorry, uh, given a point here, so given a point uh, here, uh, that defines an alpha plane, what is called, it defines a plane. So this is a doubly ruled complex manifold, and this defines an alpha plane via this incidence relation here. Okay, and that alpha plane may or may not intersect the Minkowski space, real Minkowski space, but if this lies in N5, it does. And so there you get if, uh, if psi A eta A prime lies in N5, uh, in fact, that corresponds to a uh, null geodesic. So there you get the Penrose twister correspondence for in brief um, outlined. And the basic object, so I was interested in the following problem. If you take a complex analytic surface, uh, S CP3, uh, then in fact S, the intersection with N5, this determines what's called a shear free rate congruence. And uh, so this, this is a congruence of uh, G6 in Minkowski space. And uh, you can, if you like, uh, you can construct solutions of the zero rest mass field equations from such objects. Uh, you can be quite explicit in that. And uh, you can see this another way, in fact. So you have, if you like, uh, if you uncompactify Minkowski space and look at it as just a product R3, uh, so you have your GD6 passing through here, your congruence of null GD6, and uh, you have a tangent. So at each point, uh, so each null GD6, <coughs> so your congruence of null GD6 uh, 
corresponds to a spinner field. Uh, mu A of X, say, on uh, R3. Uh, here, uh, and so in fact, so, so to be quite specific, the direction of the congruence of the ray at each point is given by a vector u, which uh, is given in fact by, if I write mu to be mu naught over mu 1, Again, getting the conventions right, uh, u is the direction just in stereographic projection. So these null geodesics, if you like, are defined by the idea, their direction, which you can look at as a vector on R3 here uh, by uh, dropping the perpendicular there, and then that is u. And that U is given, so this is a spinner field defined on, on Minkowski space, sorry, M4. Uh, so it's defined throughout M4, and you can, it, it gives you the information of that. The condition of shear free is this equation, so mu A, mu B, nabla A, A prime, mu B equals naught. That is the shear free condition. And if you use that, you can sort of use that to generate solutions of mass field equations. And uh, given and this actually decomposes into so this equation star here star it depends only on this mu. It depends only on the ratio mu naught over mu 1. It's the first point. And it's equivalent to just two equations. There are two equations in here, which you can write differently. You can see this as one equation is, if I write uh, coordinates uh, x1 and q is x2 plus i x3 for r3. then I get that mu, uh, uh, mu 1 plus uh, mu, uh, that's uh, d mu by dx1 plus mu squared dq mu, meaning d mu by dq uh, minus the mu here, minus mu, that's dq down mu north and the second equation which is the time derivative so the mu by dt plus mu squared dq mu plus dq bar mu equals naught so I get two equations and what are these two equations in fact this is the equation this first equation is the equation that u should be tangent to the fibers of a semi-conformal map so this is uh, this is one equation, u is tangent to the fibers of a semi-conformal map. And this equation, that's an invariant form. So just get rid of the coordinates, look at it in invariant form. This first equation is that. The second equation is uh, the condition, in fact, that du by dt, u being this vector field which is tangent, which sort of generates the direction of each, right? But it's just uh, minus uh, nabla R3 U, U. That's an evolution of that. So you find these two equations, and uh, the, the problem I was working on was to try to generalize this to more general space times. So you, you want to remove, you want to put a, uh, an arbitrary Riemannian manifold. <coughs> and you're given a general metric G naught, say, and you want to generalize these, these two equations. You want to preserve, you want to somehow get a space-time metric G, which is minus f of x t squared dt squared plus g of t, where uh, 
this is an evolving three manifold, and x is a point of n three. And here's a time coordinate, which has the property that you're evolving through semi-conformal maps, and to some reasonable extent, you're preserving this equation. And in fact, you have to then bring in this function and get a triple. Uh, you get three equations: one, two, and three. <laughs> Uh, the first is um, the metric evolution, uh, the other is the evolution of u, and the other involves a partial differential equation involving the function f, the second and two order derivatives of f, and so on, f, x, and t. And that's still, I mean, that's still open. I, I, can, I do not have a clean solution to that, but it looks reasonable that it can be extended in a reasonable way. But the point is, this perspective adapts really nicely to a graph, because a semi-conformal mapping is defined on a graph. Uh, let me, so I was very, I was rather um, a little bit brief. And if you don't know this, sto this story about twister theory, you probably didn't follow very well that. The key point is, um, I'm trying to say that uh, uh, this setup, so I could have called my talk Twister Theory on a Finite Graph, would have been an alternative title, if you like. Uh, this whole setup adapts really nicely to graphs. Not only that, there is a sort of dual, twister dual graph in an obvious way, which is well known uh, for a hundred odd years, called the line graph of a graph. Uh, and the whole, whole setup you find really adapts nicely to grass, and that's what I want to explain now. Uh, the grass. Oh, well, of course, there's a huge theory on grass. So V is a set of vertices or nodes, and E the edges, so they're just a description of which nodes are connected to which other nodes. Uh, so, uh, like uh, that. <laughs> pick an example at random. <clears throat> and uh, you have a function mx. This is the degree at a node x, uh, which is the number of edges. Uh, incident uh, with x. And the graph is regular. <coughs> an automorphism of a graph, so mapping phi uh, from V to V is an automorphism. Uh, yeah, I should also have introduced notation. So write, uh, write x tilde y uh, if and only if x and y are joined by an edge. Uh, then a mapping between the vertices is an automorphism if uh, x related to y is if and only if phi x uh, is related to phi of y. <coughs> So you should think of that as the analog of an isometry in geometry. That's very natural. And you can also think you can call your graph oriented. Well, yeah, I'm going to consider graphs that don't have loops and then don't have double edges. Um, 
and neither do I want to have a directed graph, which means you put an arrow on each edge. But one, everything I say could work for directed graphs as well. Um, and even double H's, but you definitely don't want the loops. <coughs> Uh, so if one, one has then an automorphism uh, of a graph, which uh, I think I was the analog of an isometry, and uh, uh, you can call call the graph uh, oriented uh, if you can color all the edges. So if it can be uh, edge colored. Uh, so I'm thinking here, call a regular graph oriented if it can be um, uh, edge colored. Because if you, if you have, in fact, a trivalent graph, that is, the degree is always 3 at each vertex. And if it is oriented, uh, if it can be edge colored, then you can kind of get back to the spinner fields. And you can really get back to the um, thing you, I started with in my motivation kind of get back to that picture. You can rebuild the spinners and so on, but I probably won't have time. To well, what does edge colored mean? Uh, so that means you can associate a color to each, uh, uh, each edge in such a way that, so if it can be edge colored by uh, M colors, uh, so if you, you can associate a color to each edge, but you might, you're not allowed to have two the same color incident at the same vertex, yeah. So, for example, uh, yeah, it can be edge colored by uh, M colors. And that, that allows you uh, at each vertex to label things. Uh, so here's a flattened. Uh, So that, that is the cube actually flattened out onto the blackboard, and you can uh, you can edge color that. You can, and it's best to do it with numbers. So one, uh, two, uh, I guess three, uh, one, one, and so on. Uh, three, uh, two, two, and one. And is that right? Now what do I have to put here? A three. No, there's two ones on one vertex there, vertical. Oh, what have I done? Two there, yeah. Sorry, one, two, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that, but if you try and do it with one less, you cannot do it. So if I take away one of those, uh, that's impossible. You cannot edge color that now, so it's not oriented. Okay. Now, the, in fact, semi conformal mappings between graphs were defined by. Hajime Urakawa in 1997. Uh, it was published later in about 2000. Uh, so, Urakawa. Well, first it's best to call the mapping phi, let, let phi. be a mapping of graphs uh, if so phi determines a mapping of the vertices of gamma 1, the vertices of gamma 2, and uh, if uh, x is related to y by an edge in gamma 1, then that implies that 5x is related to 5y. And now you can define this, the analog of semi-conformal mapping. Uh, so call such a map uh, semi-conformal if all x v1 in the vertex on the domain, uh, then writing uh, 
uh, z to be 5x, which is then a vertex on the second graph, um, then for all uh, z prime on the second graph, such that z prime is related to z, this number, so you can define this number lambda x, which depends on z prime, is going to be the number, so it's a little, you have to get your head around the definition a little bit, it's the number of x prime in the first graph such that x prime is related to x and 5x prime is z prime. So it's the, so you pick, a diagram would be useful here. Uh, so this may be x and this may be z down here, and you're mapping y, and you pick a point here which is related to z prime is connected to Z, and you're looking, say, at uh, X1 prime here, and then maybe there's another one here, X2 prime here, and these both go to here. So I haven't completed the definition, but if uh, each X, if I define that number, then that number is semi-conformal if that number is independent of Z prime. So to complete the definition, such that that uh, is independent of Z prime. <coughs> I've written that coherently. <coughs> I'm writing that for every point related to Z, this number should be independent of Z prime. Then, if it is independent of Z prime, that is the definition of the semi-conform mapping. Uh, this was brought in by Yurikawa in 1997 to characterize those mappings between graphs which preserve harmonic functions. You, you don't assume that it is surjective or something, this map, so to avoid the constant map? Um. <laughs> it seems that you could map everything onto one point. This is uh, no, uh, so in, in even in the smooth case, semi-conformal mappings are not subjective uh, in the smooth case, for example. The differentials. Uh, yeah, the differential is, yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh -huh, so no assumption. That, that's sufficient, yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> and so you have this number lambda x, which is again called a dilation. And uh, so uh, an example, for example, the, so this is cheating a bit. You're taking the configuration in the plane. And so if I call that vertex 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, and I map that uh, to this configuration, and this is so here on that one, uh, one goes to here, two goes to here, uh, three goes to here, four goes to here, five goes to here, uh, six goes to here, seven goes to there, eight goes to there, and uh, nine goes to here. And that is semi-conformal. <coughs> that mapping is semi-conformal. And the dilation is lambda to all of these, ex so the dilation is a function on the domain graph. Dilation is lambda to all of these exterior vertices. It's equal to one to all of these exterior vertices. And it's equal to two on the central vertex. So here lambda is one, so there, but here lambda is two. And that, you can check with that example, for example, that it satisfies uh, this definition. So, but now conjugate functions. <coughs> Let me get on to those. 
uh, giving them a graph, and given x uh, a vertex, you can think of, if you like, the tangent space to gamma at x would be the set of all x, y, such that y, uh, so let me call that an edge, now an oriented edge, such that y is related to x. So in other words, if I have a vertex here, here, and here, this is x, this is y1, y2, and y3, I'm going to think of the tangent space as these three vectors. And given a function f, uh, say to Rn, uh, some Euclidean space, then I can define a directional derivative of f at x, uh, acting on the oriented edge xy, to just be now derivatives become differences. So this is f of y minus f of x. And in fact, one can define, if you like, the divergence then of f at x, of df at x, is then the sum over all the y that's related to x of the derivatives x, x, y, uh, which is then um, the minus m of x, f of x, plus the sum y related to x uh, of uh, f of y. And in fact, that's the definition usually is minus the definition of the Laplacian. So that's the Laplacian of a function at x plus b. The, the definition of the, of the Laplacian of a function is given by the mean value property. That uh, is the function minus uh, the sum of the function on edges that are related to x. Uh, sorry, the sum of the function on vertices that are related to x uh, divided by m of x. Uh, that's the usual definition of the Laplacian up to sign, and of course there's a huge work on the study of the Laplacian, the heat curl, and a whole load of things on graphs. A whole load of, uh, almost all of functional analysis can be done on graphs. And um, uh, so uh, one can, uh, th this naturally fits into this. So it's very natural then to look at uh, conjugate functions. <coughs> So when our f and g are conjugate, uh, well, there's an obvious definition. Uh, so just uh, set phi to be the complex function f plus i g, and uh, look at uh, you want essentially then that uh, then say. conjugate if and only if well the sum uh, for all x in v the sum over the vertices that are uh, related to x by an edge of uh, you'd say d phi of x y squared is zero that is to say if and only if the sum y related to x of uh, phi of y minus phi of x squared is zero. So that then is the condition you want. It's the analog. So in the smooth case, if you recall, you had the sum over i uh, of d phi by dx i squared is zero. So you could think of that, if you like, as having the, uh, this is an edge d1, uh, e the 
the x three coordinate x axis at d one, d two, and d three. <coughs> So it is then a very natural definition for uh, two functions to be conjugated on a graph, or indeed for a, a complex valued function to be the analog of the uh, semi-conformal mapping from R3 into C. So in fact, uh, it's best to introduce a name. I'm not sure whether it's the best name. So call such a phi. <coughs> Phi IG, which takes V to C, a semi conformal function, uh, if it satisfies uh, this equation here. Star. It's, it's interesting, so semi-conformal is a natural, in the Smith case, is a natural generalization of conformal function, as is harmonic, a natural generalization of conformal. But an advantage, a disadvantage with harmonic on a finite graph is they're all constant, because of this mean value of property. If you look at harmonic functions on a finite graph, they're all going to be constant. But there are definitely semi-conformal functions on a finite graph. <coughs> And it turns out to be a very challenging problem to try and understand uh, what they are. So here, this is an example. Uh, if I give that vertex 0, this 1, this 1 plus i, and this i, then that satisfies, that's a, you know, the simplest example you can imagine of a semi-conformal function on a graph. You can always normalize it. So note, uh, if phi is semi-conformal, you can write it now as a function, not as a mapping between graphs. If phi is a semi-conformal function, then uh, so is a phi plus c, where a and c are two complex numbers. <coughs> so you can actually always normalize one so if it's non-constant on neigh two neighboring vertices, you can always normalize so that one vertex has a value of zero and another vertex has a value of one. And uh, so to get back in a, right, I'm going to turn that on now. Let me turn it on and talk at the same time. <laughs> I've got a very crucial point. There is a very fascinating connection here with a paper by Mike and Roger Penrose on drawing with complex numbers. orthographic projections of the regular solids, the vertices into lower dimensional subspaces, and in particular, you have possibilities to map them into the complex plane and see what polynomial equations are satisfied by the images of these things and whether you can reconstruct the solid from those. And in fact, any cube, so if you look at a cube or any n-dimensional cube, Check this down, orthogonally sounds at the complex plane. Now you can map this uh, to the origin. 
and then the other points go elsewhere, then in fact you can look at the images of the uh, three neighboring, so you can look at the image of this point, the three neighboring points that characterize the cube, this point, this point, and this point, so you have three points in the complex plane, and they have come from the cube. Uh, if and only, so call this alpha, beta, and gamma. Uh, so these have come from the cube. And the projection cube. In fact, if and only if precisely this equation is satisfied, alpha squared plus beta squared plus gamma squared vanishes. So this is very like the equation that I have now like <laughs> uh, the equation that I call star characterizing a semi-conformal function. Uh, and so, in fact, cubes then, uh, and the, by, in fact, seeing as the characterization of a semi-conformal function involves differences uh, between the values at neighboring vertices, the sums of the squares must vanish, you can see, in fact, that a cube is the optimal kind of shape, um, the optimal kind of graph, the one skeleton of a cube, that has infinitely many conjugate, infinitely many semi-conformal functions. You simply take any position of the cube in space, you project it, and you assign those values to the vertices. And that will be an example of a semi-conformal function on the one skeleton of a cube. Um, and so, I uh, give some. So, so here's just some examples to finish with. Um, as I hadn't had as much time as <laughs> time sort of flashed by much quicker than I thought it would. So, so here, here's an example of uh, some conformal function on the cube, one skeleton of the cube, and. Uh, here's another graph that has a semi-conformal function. And uh, this, that has come, in fact, you can see that coming from an attaching process. <coughs> uh, if you have uh, two vertices where the function has the same value, then you can attach those two vertices. So here you've got a semi-conformal function on the square. Here you've got it on this eight-sided polygon. And because you have these two common values, you can attach the four common values, you can attach that. Forget the example I just gave. Um, uh, and in fact, I told Mike about his grass story on Monday. <laughs> And I was worried because I couldn't get rid of Q. Uh, you saw this last example. So, so Maple happily can calculate some of these examples. So Maple uh, found this example that I've just put up. And uh, then I was suddenly disappointed to find that that yet again came from cubes, or came from squares in this case, or something uh, similar. Um, and uh, so I told Mike about all this on Monday. So by Tuesday morning, he found a different, a nice example. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, Mike's example, where you've now got a six-sided figure in the interior, or two concentric six-sided figures. <clears throat> but in fact, it turns out to be amazingly challenging to find finite graphs, or to you know, the problem of classifying finite graphs to support these functions seems to be very difficult. But going back to the original motivation, you're now, you're wanting your fields should be on graphs that may evolve also as a step-by-step, -step, and the functions involve step-by-step. -step. Uh, I haven't had time to do that, but just to give you an idea of how that should be, you can actually do that. This is only, you won't follow this, but this is sort of calculation where you have an oriented, the regular, edge colored graph and I've taken the example of the cube here and you start with a function you can actually generate a triple of complex numbers then whose sums are zero 
you can generate the analog of the U you had. Um, you can actually generate the evolution equation that I had in the continuous or smooth case for semi-conformal map in space-time. And uh, it involves a Laplacian, and then you can then compute the next function. And this example does preserve the semi-conformality. Um, but to actually prove that happens more generally, I do not know how or when, if it happens more generally. Just the observation that one of the few examples when I can com compute everything in sign does in fact happen uh, more generally. So, so I've, uh, I've gone way beyond my time, so I better stop here. Thank you very much.